Hey friends, it's Rodney Lewis Boyd here. I'm excited to talk to you about uh, the book of Philippians. That's one of my favorite books. Uh, a matter of fact, I've written a workbook uh, called Flipping Out Over Philippians. And it's a verse-by-verse -verse study. And at the end, if you want that, you can let me know. I'll be glad to send a copy of it to you for free. But what I want to do today is just kind of go through Philippians. It's only four chapters, but it's packed with stuff. But I'm not going to go into detail on every verse. But there are things that just jump out at me. And I want to see if they'll jump out at you too. Uh, the Holy Spirit's so good. He's the teacher. He'll teach us things. He'll show us wisdom and insight that that maybe uh, you might not even get in a seminary. He'll reveal things to you. Why? So that you can not only see what he was doing to people in 61 AD, that, but he'll also show uh, how these things can practically apply to your life. And if you start memorizing some of these scriptures, your prayer life is going to change. Trust me. I've been at the altar the prayer altar, people come. I'm so anxious about so and so, and then you, then you, uh, you uh, if you stored it in your mind, you start thinking, "Well, Lord, this person here is filled with anxiety." But you tell us, Lord, to be anxious for nothing. That includes whatever they're going through. But in everything, Lord, help this person be able to pray, talk to you, help them to supplicate, be humbly. Uh, specific for you, Lord, and, I, and help them to begin to thank you no matter what it looks like. And I thank you, Lord, that the peace that surpasses all comprehension will guard this person's heart and their mind in Christ Jesus, in the anointed one, and in his anointing. Praise you, God. Well, how did I pray that? I study in the book of Philippians, memorizing verses. You can do the exact same thing. So let's kind of go through this thing, and I'm just going to start picking out little things uh, and uh, see how it goes. First thing I love is the uh, Philippians 1, 6. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, the good news is uh, you're a work in progress. He's not through yet. That's not an excuse it's just facts. And he started it in you. You didn't start it in yourself. He first loved you. Jesus first came to the cross to die for you. And, and even after he was risen from the dead and you finally accepted what Jesus did as the substitute, the work was continuing and he's going to perfect it. How long? Until the day of Jesus Christ, until Christ comes back. He hasn't come yet. Just keep on keeping on. So that's the first thing that pops out at me. Let's see here. Let's uh, go through some more stuff here. Oh, I love this. I love this. Philippians 1.21. One of the first verses I learned. I used to call it my life verse. Until I found some more verses, it became a life verse. And then others became a life verse. Philippians 121, for to me, Paul, to live on planet earth is Christ and to die is gain. I love that. As long as he's on here on earth, he's living for Christ. It's kind of like Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. The same guy that wrote that in Galatians wrote this, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But then I love this part. You know, you always, people die. Uh, you always have the, well, I guess it was just God's time. Only God knows. I went to a funeral once and there was a horse reef with a phone in the middle of it. And on the banner it said, it had a telephone, said, Jesus called. I'm thinking maybe if Jesus called, I might not answer it. Mm. But Paul seemed to have a choice in the matter. It wasn't just one day he's walking along and poof, he's gone. 
He just died all of a sudden. But if I am to live on in the flesh, <laughs> this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. He had a choice to choose to go to heaven, to choose to stay here on planet Earth. But I'm hard pressed. It was a difficult decision from both directions. <laughs> but I'm hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and who wouldn't want to be and be with Christ for that is much better, very much better. It's kind of like, you know, people who are Christians and strong in the faith and praying for a healing and then they die. It boggles the mind. Why would that happen? They must not have had enough faith or you didn't have enough faith. Hey, what about that their desire to be with Jesus was more than to stay here with you? <laughs> That's a hard-pressed choice, but it happens all the time. It wasn't necessarily it was their time but they wanted to go. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. So Paul had a mission, he had a purpose, and it was to stay here and not go up to heaven. You know, for him to live would be Christ and to die would be gain. Crazy. I'm flipping out over Philippians right now. I'm convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Wow. I'm so glad so many people didn't die and stayed here for me. And that the key is, while you're still here, what are you doing for somebody? What are you doing? Just sucking in the oxygen and taking up the oxygen from the rest of us? Or are you working for Christ? Are you living for Christ? Are you doing your purpose instead of dying and going on to heaven. That's crazy talk. Now, <clears throat> let's go to chapter two. This is another great part. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is, and I believe there is, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship or koinonia uh, uh, of the spirit, Big S, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete. Paul was expecting to have completed joy because something you're going to do. Well, it's a good thing you didn't go to heaven because you were here to help make his joy complete. Being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, passionate for one thing. Then he slips over, do nothing from selfishness. <laughs> do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. That word nothing means zip, zero, zilch, nothing, honey, zero, nada. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but in contrast to that, with humility of mind, now, humility of mind is the way you think, speak, and act. And so, when you humble yourself, then you can begin to speak differently, uh, think differently, speak differently, and act differently. The neat thing is, God's not going to beat you into submission. <laughs> oh, Lord, just make me humble. Or, we like to sing about it. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. And the Lord says, I'm not going to change your heart. You choose and humble yourself. Are you flipping out now? <laughs> I'm not saying the Holy Spirit won't help that process, but it all starts with a decision and a choice on your part. You have free will. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. I used to put out a newsletter or something 
Top 10 reasons it's okay for me to cuss. And it'd always be something new. Top 10 reason. And the number one reason is okay for me to do whatever I want to do because it's all about me, baby. It's all about me. <laughs> but it's not. Regard one another is more important than yourself. Just the word joy itself, the acronym is Jesus first, others second, you last. Joy. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest. And some people say, and then goes on, but also for the interest of others. The way people read that is, don't look out for your personal interest. Look for other people's interest. Don't you worry about yourself. Well, I think that's wrong. It says, in my version, New American Standard, the, the Bible that Paul wrote, do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. I'm convinced that you got to, as, as uh, Jesus said in, in uh, Mark 12, you got to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor. Okay, wait a minute. Oh, there's more? As yourself. If you can't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor, and you're definitely going to love Jesus. And that part where it says, love your neighbor as yourself, and James becomes known as the royal law. So, Jesus first, others second, and you. Okay? And so, then he says, I like this part too. Have this attitude in yourselves. Attitude Everybody got it. It's good, bad, or ugly. But we're to have that attitude of looking out for others' interests, not just your own, and not have being conceited and, and regarding others as more important than themselves. Have this attitude. I like to say it that way, attitude. And, uh, you know, whenever you read the Beatitudes, the first uh, sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, where Jesus speaks in nine places of blessings. He said, and, 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 and not he said, but the Beatitudes be the attitudes that you need to be having. Beatitudes. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, Jesus had an attitude. He didn't have an attitude problem. Now we got the attitude problem. We need an attitudinal adjustment, a fine-tuning, calibrated by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God. Have this attitude, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, now I'm thinking that if you're God in the flesh, you got a right to have an attitude. You got a right to grasp onto that. But sometimes he tells us uh, he existed in the form of God. He did not regard equality with a God a thing to be grasped. You know, I grew up in a church. I got saved in another church uh, for the past 40 something years. I've been a a uh, uh, balanced Pentecostal charismatic, I mean, charismatic, I speak in tongues. But sometimes religion gets in the way and people hold on to their tongues as something to be grasped. That you think you're better than somebody else. Nah, 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 boo, boo. <laughs> no, you can't hold on to that as something to be grasped. Well, what do you got to do with that stuff? You know, in uh the Jewish people, they had traditions and attitudes. And Jesus said that because of the traditions of men, it's in Mark 7, I think, because of the traditions of men, it nullified or made of none effect the Word of God. That's what traditions can do. That's what attitudes can do. That uh, is what, uh, regarding uh, your traditions, uh, a thing to be grasped. 
Sometimes you got to let them go. That's right. I'm fixing to break out in song. I let it go. Oh, yeah, never mind. <clears throat> well, what did he do if it wasn't grasping on to being God in the flesh? He emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, a willing servant, not a servant under compulsion, but a servant who served out of love, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself. God didn't come down and beat him down. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You know, we have to die to ourselves. Paul said, I die daily. We have to humble ourselves in the name of the Lord. Again, there's a song for everything. <clears throat> Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. And he will lift you up. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him. He lifted him up. He bestowed on him the name which is above every name that is named, so that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word Lord means kurios. It means mister. It means sir. It's a sign of respect. It means master. It means the controller, the one in control. So when you say Jesus is Lord, you're merely saying, Jesus, you're in control. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I hear that. I will do that. Yes, sir. That's where Jesus is Lord. Sometimes uh, it looks like the world is our Lord. It looks like politics is our Lord. It looks like economics is our Lord. It looks like world event, or events is, is our Lord because they seem to be in control and it spews out of our mouth every time something shakes us. But when the world events shake us, and Jesus is Lord comes out, then you got something. It's like a, a cup of coffee, and I've got my coffee right here. Mm -hmm. It's filled with delicious Hebrews coffee. And uh, and if you take that coffee cup and shake it, shake it, shake it, coffee's going to come out and get everything around it messed up. And, uh, and you ask somebody, well, why the coffee come out of that cup? And, that, and you, people usually say, well, because you shook it. Well, no. Coffee came out of that cup because there's coffee in the cup. The shaking only revealed. And so the shaking of the world only reveals who really is Lord in your life. So that's another great passage. I love that. Let's see what else we can find in here. There's so much more. Everything is good. And uh, uh, I like uh, John 3, 1. Whenever I teach... I tend to say the same thing over and over again. And I used to feel guilty about that. Somebody came up to me once and said, why are you saying the same thing over again? You said that last week. Well, because finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again to you is no trouble to me. It is a safeguard for you. Well, <laughs> repetition Repetition, repetition is the safeguard. And so I repeat the same things over and over again. And I say it a different way. Sometimes it sinks in, sometimes it doesn't, you know. And, and Paul, uh, in another place, I think it's in Galatians, says that he'll do that until Christ, the anointed one, and his anointing is formed inside of you. You're going through a process. Wait a minute. That sounds like I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. The more you hear it, the more you think about it, the more you do it, the more it becomes you and Christ is formed in you where you've got an anointing in you. 
And then you would combine that with the Holy Spirit as rivers of living water that will spew out of your innermost being. The Holy Spirit will come out of you, not just stay inside of you. So uh, that's that's good stuff there. Let's go on. Uh, all good stuff, all good stuff. Let's get to chapter four. I love this part. This whole thing's chock full, and this is probably where we'll stay for the next mm, maybe 10 minutes. I'm not sure. Therefore, my beloved brethren, <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse 1, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord. He had to encourage them to stand firm in the Lord. Why? Because they can become lax in the Lord. They can let their guard down in the Lord. So stand firm. Get ready. Uh, and then he said, verse 2, talking about standing firm, I urge you idea and Sintik, I don't know if that's how you say it, but they're names of two women, to live in harmony. Apparently, they weren't living in harmony. Do you know any church members who don't live in harmony? <laughs> you know, where two or three are gathered in, uh, in at church, there's trouble. Should be where two or three are gathered in his name. He's right there in their midst. But I, I guarantee you, if you got two people with differing opinion, there's going to be trouble. And these two ladies were not living in harmony. They were living in disharmony. And uh, and then he told the people that are surrounding them, uh, indeed, true companions, I ask you also to help these women who shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. You see somebody who's having problems, help them. Guide them back. Get them together singing the same song, different notes, but in harmony. And then number four, famous, rejoice in the Lord. And the word rejoice means to uh, hop up, spin around violently. Just rejoice. This is not a passive thing. Rejoice in the Lord always. And it was so important that Paul wanted to get this point across to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always and again. I say rejoice. And then he said, let or allow your gentle spirit, not your haughty spirit, not your arrogant spirit, be known to all men why the Lord is near. How near is the Lord? Is he up in heaven? How many miles is that? The Lord is near. He's deep within your spirit. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. And so the Lord sees you when you're in disharmony. He sees you when you're not rejoicing, but grumbling and complaining. So he's, Paul says, you do these things and be gentle. Let people see it. Why? <laughs> the Lord is near. And then, my, <laughs> chock full, flipping out on Philippians. Be anxious for nothing. The word anxiety means to be pulled in 20 different directions and you can't focus on what's important. But he says, be anxious. And that word, that literally means don't be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. Now, nothing, not a zip, zero, zilt, zero, nothing, honey. Nothing. Be anxious for nothing. There's nothing that you can ha that's happening to you that you need to be anxious for. And it's your choice. God's not going to come away and take your anxiety away. Oh, the Holy Spirit will help you, yes. But he gives us free will and the power to choose and to act upon his word. Be anxious for nothing, but in contrast, in everything. If you drew if you draw on a piece of paper nothing and then everything, draw a line down the middle and write everything that you're anxious for. I can't pay my bills. My marriage is falling apart. Putin's over there in, in, in the Ukraine. Uh, Biden's in the White House. Trump might come back in the White House. Yada, yada, yada. Blah, blah, blah. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And then you take an arrow and point all the way to the everything. They're the exact same thing that you're not to be anxious about. But in everything, what do you do instead of being anxious? By prayer, talking to God, two-way communication, and supplication, or as they say in New Orleans, supplication, uh, which simply means to be humbly specific, not shotgun blast. You be, you know, oh, help me, baby, I'll let your bill. Oh, he hears that. He may answer that. 
but he wants you to be specific. He wants you to say, Lord, I need $353 to pay my electric bill. Now that's specific. And then after you do that with thanksgiving, the giving of thanks, this is where your faith kicks in and you start thanking God for paying the $357.43 or whatever it was, even if the electric company is rolling in your driveway to turn your electricity off. You're praying in faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You're walking by faith and not by sight. You're living by faith. You have faith in God constantly. And as you pray and thank him, you can expect him to answer those prayers. And it goes on to say, let or allow your request to be made known to God. I know people who won't tell God what they want because they're too proud and they're going to pull up their bootstraps and they'll, they'll make it on their own. God will let you do that. Have fun. I'm going to let my request be made known to God. That's why I'm flipping out over Philippians. <laughs> Cause and effect. I always like cause and effect. And the peace of God, the calmness, the calm rest, the lack of anxiety and frustration and fear, the peace of God, not the peace of Rod or the peace of you, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, the kind of peace that I can understand and when there's lack of conflict, where there's peace treaties, where there's no war, where I got money in the bank, where my 401's kicking in, where the gas price is at $1.25. But when there's peace in the midst of the whirlwind, that's when peace that surpasses all comprehension, it'll guard the word guard means like a Roman garrison. The elite soldiers of the time gathering around where nothing can get at you. The, 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 the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds. The heart and the mind really are one. There's another teaching on that, but trust me. Those two areas, let's just say there were two separate areas, but just say those areas will be guarded in Christ Jesus. Jesus means God of salvation. Emmanuel means God with us. Christ is the Messiah. Christ is the anointed one who was anointed here we go. With yoke breaking, burden lifting, oppression removing, harassment, healing power of the Holy Ghost. The same Holy Ghost that dwells in you. The same Christ that's in you that's the hope of glory. The same rivers of living water that when you drink from them, the well uh, is, is created and it comes up and it comes out of your innermost being flowing uh, and touching people all around you. And then Jesus says in John 7, by the way, I'm talking about the Holy Ghost in you coming out of you. The peace of God. <laughs> oh. well, you know, sometimes as I'm teaching these things, I just sense the presence of God. I'm convinced that there's a God frequency and vibration that just kind of, and it's called the anointing. And when you tap into the frequency and vibration of God that's in you and it flows out of you, sometimes I just get numb. Sometimes I want to cry. Sometimes I just, <laughs> sometimes I just, <laughs> just want to laugh. Sometimes people who are being prayed for fall out in the spirit. We don't understand those things, but all we know is that the power of God is more powerful than anything the devil can throw at you. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And then we get to verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, 
whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of a good report, if there is any excellence and if anything is worthy of praise. Remember, all those things are positive things, not negative things. It's not what the news says. It's not what negative people tell you. This is what the Word of God is. Let or allow your mind to dwell on these things. Quit dwelling on negative stuff that deletes your faith. Start where you're dwelling will be telling on your lips and in your actions. Then Paul says, the things that you've learned, received, heard, and seen in me, practice those things, exercise those things, do those things daily. Cause and effect and the God of peace will be with you no matter what you're going through. Are you flipping out over Philippians yet? Now comes the kicker. You know, Paul up here said, finally, brethren. Well, he wasn't. It was like, well, I see by the watch, I've got one more point, And then he goes on for another 20 minutes. Uh, you know what it means when a preacher looks at his watch? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> and so, verse 10. And I love this whole section because it speaks of the secret. You know, there was a, a movie out in a book called The Secret, uh, it has a lot of great thoughts in it, a lot of it's mumbo-jumbo, but this was the secret before the secret was the secret, and Paul had learned it. You know, the secret can be learned. You know, just because you get saved, you have to continue to learn. You know, just because uh, you, you got saved, don't you think that you need your mind renewed over and over and over, a paradigm made and watch and repetition, all that, it has to keep on keeping on. And that's what Paul's fixing to say here. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Now that at last you have received, you have revived your concern <clears throat> for me. And indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Well, what's the opportunity? Well, this Philippians is part of the prison epistles or letters. Remember that an epistle is not the a wife of an apostle. <laughs> but uh, uh, Paul is in the prison, most likely Rome, writing this thing. And, uh, and, and, the, and the church in Philippi that he's writing this letter to uh, was sending him money. Money. You know that money is not the root of evil. It's not the root of all kinds of evil. It's that love of money. It's that love of money that draws people away. But money's good. And Paul, to be actually, he could use some money at this point. It wasn't a barter system. They weren't bringing him a cow to be in prison with him. It was actual money. Probably shekels. Silver and gold. Silver and gold. You know, the song goes, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I give in thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Well, in this case, the silver and gold they had. And such as we have, we give you thee in prison. And uh, he says, uh, you've arrived your concern. And then I like this, what Paul says. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. I know how to get along with humble means, with nothing, and I also know how to live in prosperity with everything, in any and every circumstance. You ever find yourself in a circumstance? I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having an abundance and suffering need. And then the verse that he underscores about how he's learned to have money or not have money, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We, we use that for everything, but the focus was money, but I really believe you can use it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, <laughs> no matter what, 
You've done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me. No money, nobody gave me money, gold or silver, in the matter of giving and receiving. Do you realize that the matter of giving and receiving is a spiritual principle, the law of reciprocity? Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men... I thought God was the giver. Yes, he uses men to give into your bosom. But no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. More than once, Paul got money. Not that I seek the gift. It itself. But I seek for the profit which increases to your account. Paul knew that if they gave to him, even if he didn't need it, even if he didn't want it, it would go back to them and they would get what back? Money, like kind. It would bless them. And so, but I have received everything in full and have abundance. Oh, I thought God wanted him to have a vow of poverty. No, abundance. In Joshua 1 8, where it talks about this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Joshua 1 8. Well, true biblical prosperity is having enough to meet your needs and an overflow to help others. True success is accomplishing the purposes of God in your life. He says, I am amply supplied, having received from some name I can't pronounce. <laughs> what you have sent. This offering was a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. It was a sacrifice of faith. Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Well, this was well-pleasing to God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You must come to him believing that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and not just passively inquire. And then kicking the last verse here, and I love this, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Your needs, not your greeds, right? Flipping out over Philippians. Listen, that last verse Again, when you memorize these verses and you start thinking on those verses, thinking on these things, meditating, speaking them forth, good things happen to you. And when you're standing before uh, uh, lost people or non-Christians, they ask you questions, you'll have an answer for them. It'll be the Word of God. For example, <laughs> I humbly say this, I was in the... Uh, uh, aisles of Walmart looking for a can of chili. I needed some chili so I could make myself some chili cheese dogs with onions uh, <laughs> and peppers and jalapenos. I couldn't find the chili I wanted and there was an old man next to me and uh, I said, hey, how you doing? And uh, he started cussing Joe Biden, started complaining of the gas prices going up, blaming it on the Democrats, Blaming the country falling apart, yada, yada, yada. Blaming Putin, yada, yada, yada. He just kept going on and on. Negativity. The, the, I mean, the whole world was going to hell in a hand basket, and he was riding on the, in it. And he took a breath, and I finally <laughs> said, because I kept looking for chili, and I said, you want to know what I do? Yeah. I said, whenever I'm at the gas station, and I'm putting in the nozzle. I like to pump the gas, whether it's $1.25 or whether it's $7, it doesn't matter. And I say out loud, I thank God that my God shall supply all of my gas needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And there's no shortage in Christ Jesus or, or his glory. Amen. He said, all right, all right, all right. And I said, you know what I do about the government? 
He said, what? I said, I follow 1 Timothy chapter 2. I pray for all authority. I pray for all the governors. I pray for all the elected officials. I pray for presidents. I pray for Putin. I pray for yada, 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 yada. And the reason being because in the Bible it says we do we pray for these instead of griping and complaining about them so we have peace, live in peace. Oh, mister, come back. I'm not through. <laughs> well, wow, this went longer than normal. I would apologize, but I'm not sorry. I know some people like little snippets, but if you can take time and listen to this and enjoy it, I hope you will. Um, if you want uh, the flipping the flipping out over Philippians workbook, it's for free. Verse by verse study of all the verses. Uh, it's, it's yours for the asking. You can uh, go on Facebook, write me Lewis Boyd. Uh, you can uh, write me at uh, Rodney Lewis Boyd at gmail dot com. You can go to my website at www.rodneylewisboyd.com. Um, so if you want it, ask for it. Let me pray for you. <clears throat> you know, sometimes my shoulder leans down. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I pray for you, and I thank you, Lord, that as people who are listening to this, Lord, we're on the same frequency and vibration of your transmitter and receiver, our Father who art in heaven. Lord, I thank you that your uh, transmitter and receiver is on a clear channel. And Lord, we are on a clear channel because we got the static of the devil off. And I thank you that there's this clear channel, there's clear flow of your anointing. The vibrations and frequencies of your anointing and your power and your authority. Lord, I thank you for touching people right now, speaking to them, healing them, filling them with the Holy Ghost. I thank you for people who have been saved for years, who have had the Holy Spirit in them for years, but are feeling stagnated and the Spirit's grieved. I thank you for a release of the Holy Spirit, a flow of the rivers of living water out of their innermost beings, their bellies, the Holy Spirit. And right now, as there's a prompting in your spirit, something's not right, something's different, something's changed, receive the Spirit of God. If you ask for the Holy Spirit, he's not going to give you a snake. He's not going to give you a counterfeit. But how much more for those, as it says in Luke 8, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit? Who They already have the Holy Spirit, but give the Holy Spirit for those who ask. Just like the people in Philippians or I'm sorry, in uh, Ephesus. Paul said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? We hadn't even heard there was the Holy Spirit. Here, let me lay my hands on you. They received the Holy Spirit. A shift and change in their ability to pray, to hear God's word, to read God's word with new clarity. Like the men on the road to Emmaus, didn't our hearts burn when he explained the scriptures to us in the breaking of the bread? So I thank you you're doing that right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, watch this. I'm going to turn it off. <laughs>